Hello, everybody. My name is Nazali Ganchi, and welcome to the December uh, Appeal webinar, the last webinar of 2021. Um, we have uh, three speakers today, and uh, the first uh, is a joint talk by Stefan Hartmann and Michael Player. Stefan Hartmann is a, a professor at the University of Düsseldorf, and he was also the main organizer of ProtoLang 7 this year. Many congratulations again for this wonderful event. And then our second speaker is Michael Player, uh, who um, uh, is also one of the, the main organizers <laughs> of ProtoLang this year. He uh, was a collaborator there, and he's also a collaborator of the Center for Language Evolution Studies in Poland. So uh, please go ahead. The talk is going to be on language evolution, of course, please. Okay, thank you. And more specifically, we are going to talk about compositionality in language evolution. And we're going to present more or less a, well, a shortened version of a paper that we are currently revising that we wrote together with our colleague Ryan Lippick. And um, we are um, basically splitting it in two parts. I will introduce the basics uh, of compositionality, which is a key term in linguistics and philosophy of language, and also a very controversial term. And then Michael will uh, talk a little bit about the relevance of compositionality and combinatoriality in language evolution. Here's a quick overview of what we are going to present. Um, and yeah, I think I don't have to go through all the points because I already mentioned the um, most important things about the structure. So I think we can go to the next slide already. And I will start by talking a little bit about um, the concept of compositionality. If we hear a sentence like the cat is on the mat, to understand the sentence, we have to understand the meanings of the individual words, but also the way in which they are combined. And that's basically the principle of compositionality that has been proposed in philosophy of language. Um, what do the two parts mean? So of course, we need to know the meanings of the individual words, but we also have to understand the structure that's behind this combination, because if you have the cat is on the mat, it means something different than the mat is on the cat or is the cat on the mat. So structural features like word order play a role when we interpret composite utterances. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the principle of compositionality is often called Frege principle, but the attribution to Frege is disputed. Um, a couple of people say that there's something like the compositionality principle underlying the thoughts of Frege. Others say there's nothing remotely like it there, and it was actually um, it was actually Carnap who later attributed it to um, Frege. So that's quite controversial. But uh, anyway, what's important for us is that it's a key principle in semantics that has especially been adopted in formal semantics, and it can be summarized as the meaning of a complex expression is determined by its structure and the meanings of its constituents. Compositionality has been discussed in different disciplines like linguistics, philosophy, but also in psychology and as Michael will later show in primatology. However, there are considerable differences in how compositionality is understood and especially in the scope that is assigned to compositionality. There are especially different approaches in formal and functional linguistics. So formal approaches to semantics focus on modeling how simplified concepts are composed. And therefore, the principle of compositionality plays an important role there because uh, they are really interested in figuring out how we uh, determine the meaning of complex expressions from their constituent parts um, without paying much attention to the linguistic or non-linguistic context. Functional approaches, by contrast, see compositionality more as a cognitive phenomenon, as they are in general more interested in getting at the cognitive underpinnings of language, and importantly, they also see compositionality as a matter of degree. 
So um, one functional linguist, John Taylor, um, said that strict compositionality is rarely, if ever, encountered, and that basically summarizes the usage-based approach that uh, kind of opposes the formalist approach. So usage-based linguistics, especially construction grammar, assigns a more central role to idiomaticity. And um, one reason for this is that there are quite a few examples where complex, uh, where the meaning of complex expressions is only an approximation um, of, or only an approximation of their full meaning can be derived from the meanings of their constituent parts. Examples of such underspecification include n plus n compounds. So if you have compounds like dog cake, it can be either a cake for a dog or a cake made of dog meat um, or possessives. If you have a structure like Adele's new book, uh, it could be the book that Adele just bought or the book she wrote, or she could be the publisher of the book or whatever. Um, so there are a number of different interpretations. That's why, uh, for example, Ron Langecker sees compositionality as a matter of degree and argues that linguistic units are symbolically complex to different degrees, which means that they are composed of smaller linguistic elements. And he also argues that complex expressions differ in their analyzability and he interprets analyzability as the flip side of compositionality. He illustrates this with this example of a lipstick maker where he argues that a couple of, uh, well, it's basically a compound composed of two compounds. And while a lipstick is a fairly lexicalized compound uh, maker, uh, which is of course not a compound, but a derivative maker um, could, be argued to be relatively compositional. Um, and so linguistic units differ in the degree to which they can be analyzed. Especially cognitive linguistics and construction grammar assume that the scope of compositionality is much smaller than previously assumed. And as I said before, they emphasize that language is formulaic and idiomatic. Uh, for example, linguistic units often occur together in specific contexts, as Spivey has put it, units that occur together, blur together, um, and there's another slogan, units that are used together, fused together, which are, of course, uh, adopted from Hab's uh, famous slogan that um, that neurons that wire together fire together, and it is assumed that the same also plays a role in linguistic entrenchment. So um, specific units that are used together are entrenched as chunks, as units, and this leads to a high degree of uh, formulaicity in language. And as these formulaic items are also tied to the context they occur in, they develop meaning elements that cannot be derived compositionally. A famous example that has often been discussed in construction grammar is the what's X doing Y construction, as in uh, what are you doing with that knife, which uh, cannot really be understood as a, a simple innocent question, um, but it also, um, entails a certain degree of negative semantic prosody that can be argued to be part of the constructional meaning of this pattern. Um, apart from compositionality, there's also combinatoriality. Uh, so there's this uh, distinction that Michael will talk a little bit more about and uh, compositionality and combinatoriality have both been um, brought in connection with the duality of patterning, which Hockett has famously proposed as uh, one of his linguistic design features. And uh, Kirby and Tamaris actually argue that it's the most, arguably the most fundamental uh, of those design feature. The term duality of patterning refers to the phenomenon that language enables combinatorial structure on two different levels. So on the one hand, meaningless sounds can be combined into meaningless morphemes. So if we have sounds like k, a and t, we can combine them to cat and meaningful morphemes can themselves be combined to more complex units like complex words, phrases, sentences, and so on. As uh, 
And the first would be called combinatoriality, that we combine meaningless sounds to meaningful morphemes, whereas the second one, uh, the combination of meaningful items to other meaningful items would be called uh, compositionality. As um, duality of patterning is seen as a design feature of language, this means, according to Hockett, on uh, the one hand that it's, uh, of course, characteristic of human language, but also that it's unique to human language. And this is something that has been doubted in recent years and in recent research. And that's something that Michael will talk about in the second part of this talk. Right, okay. So um, I'll, I'll take over from, from Stefan. Um, and talk a bit about compositionality and combinatoriality across species. Uh, generally, um, the question of whether animal communication exhibits even the primitive form of human syntax has sparked some of the fiercest debates in the field, as Fishbein and colleagues have observed in a recent uh, paper. And the kind of more dominant view generally is expressed by Herford, for example, who says that no non-human has any semantically compositional syntax, where the form of the syntactic combination determines how the meanings of the parts combine to make the meaning of the whole. And I want to look at some examples of Composi compositionality and combinatoriality across species from, from recent years, some of them also um, kind of being more recent than Herford's um, claim. And so we'll start with a very brief overview that um, when we look at animal communication, basically we can distinguish between single units and combinations. And single units are quite widespread so alarm calls for specific predators uh, do exist in a wide range of mammals and birds. So in mammals, for example, in verb monkeys, putty nose monkeys, Campbell's monkeys, titty monkeys, murk cats, and prairie dogs, and in birds, for example, in the American robin and great tits, but also in many others. So this is something um, that is quite widespread. Um, the most famous example probably is the vervet monkey alarm call where um, they have at least three signals um, that they kind of utter emit in the presence of a leopard, of an eagle or a snake, and they show appropriate behavior depending on which call it is. So for example, snake, they stand up and they look at the ground, look where the snake is. Um, a system that is much more complex on the meaning side are great ape, great ape gestures. So um, great apes have been documented to uh, use between 60 and 100 uh, different gestures in the wild um, with a limited set of meanings. But the interesting thing, of course, is what about great ape combinations? Um, Liebal and colleagues, for example, analyzed the sequence length of chimpanzee gestures, and they found that the sequence length was um, between two to 39 gestures. And however, two thirds of these were only two gestures, and 40% were repetitions of previous gestures. Ignore the including humans question mark. I don't know how that got in there. Let's uh, <laughs> ignore that. Um, Byrne and colleagues summarize in a recent paper that basically no evidence of syntactic structure has yet been detected in great ape gesture combinations. One interesting aspect um, in later work by Katja Liebal and uh, colleagues, for example, Linda Onya, is um, what they call componentiality. And that is looking at um, the composition of a gesture, not in terms of the sequence, but in terms of the different components that make a gesture uh, meaningful. And what Onya and colleagues did was that they looked at the different body parts and how they interacted 
in producing a particular meaningful gesture. Um, in particular, they looked at two gestures, the stretched arm gesture and the bent arm gesture, and looked at how it was combined with different facial expressions, including uh, bared teeth, the funnel lip, and they have been able to observe that actually here, um, for example, the stretched arm gestures like this, um, plus bare teeth, gives a stronger affiliative response than just the stretched arm gesture. Um, and whereas the bent arm gesture um, with bare teeth does not have an effect, um, bare the bent arm gesture with the front lip is affiliation and also on its own. So this, this is one interesting way of looking at it, not only at sequences, but at different parts that make up a communicative signal. Um, a further quite interesting uh, proposal, it's quite recent, is again looking at instances of compositionality not in the vocal domain or in this case not even at the gestural domain but in chimpanzee drumming and that is a behavior that chimpanzees show um, or have been observed where when there's group movement they drum or kick against a tree and uh, Christoph Bush in um, observations of wild chim chimpanzees in the Thai forest has shown that basically the way they, um, the alpha male drums on the trees seems to have some um, meaningful structure. And specifically, he um, observed three main patterns, namely um, what he calls 1A, 1B, meaning the chimpanzee first drums on one tree and then drums on another. And this leads to a change in travel direction of the group. And 2A, meaning um, the chimpanzee drums twice on, twice on the same tree within two minutes, that leads to resting period of about 60 minutes. Interestingly enough, these um, two signals can also be combined. And here you see they are quite, they, they can be mixed in a way. So either um, the chimpanzee drums first on one tree and then it goes to a different tree and drums twice on that tree, or the chimpanzee drums twice on one tree and then goes to a different tree and drums once on that tree. And that means change of direction and resting period so that they first changed uh, direction and then rest. And in a very recent paper, uh, Gabrich has argued that this can actually be seen as semantic compositionality, similar to verb-verb combinations, because it basically means change travel direction and rest. The thing that uh, Gabrich also argues that is that we can not only see that as semantic compositionality in terms of verb-verb, but also the signal reduction we have, because it's not 1a plus 1b plus 2a, but it's actually something like 1a plus 2b or 2a plus 1b. So only parts of the previous signals are integrated or blended into a new signal. Uh, his argument is that that actually can be seen in a way similar to blends in human language, like in motel from uh, motor hotel, smog, smoke and fog, or Brangelina from Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, um, which is um, something where you know need much more testing but it's an interesting proposal when we look at um combinations in the vocal domain um one very famous example is um put the putty nose monkey because um the putty nose monkey they have two calls for leopard and for eagle, the piao call and the hack call. And the interesting thing is that if they combine the piao and the hack call into a piao, piao, hack, hack sequence, um, it means let's go. 
So what we have here is a combination of two meaningful elements into a new sequence. However, um, remember again, the distinction that Stefan made between combinatoriality and compositionality, where combinatoriality means we combine elements into a new sequence with a new meaning, but the meaning of the sequence cannot be directly derived from the meaning of its component parts, like in, uh, for example, phonology, in uh, human language, or in these piao hack combinations. Eagle uh, plus leopard does not give you oh, let's go somewhere. Um, compositionality, on, on the other hand, is combining elements into new sequence with new meaning, and the meaning can be derived from the meaning of its component parts, like basically if with the concepts of red and apple, we get red apple. In English, if we combine red with apple, we get red apple. In Polish, uh, if we um, combine czerwone and jabłko, we get czerwone and jabłko. In German, if we combine rot and apfel, we get roter apfel um, as classical examples of compositionality. Um, one example where it has been argued that this could potentially be uh, conceived of as a compositional system in a limited degree is um, the Campbell's monkeys alarm call system um, because they have um, basically calls for pre specific predators. So they have a hawk call for eagle and a crack call for leopard. Um, and for example, a boom call in many non-predatory contexts. Now, the interesting thing is that they seem to combine these calls with another meaning element like ooh. So if you hear the actual call is something like ooh, but um, that's the way it's you know formally spelled. Um, and hock ooh is used for disturbances in the canopy, canopy, so above you, and crack ooh for any disturbance. Waku for disturbances in the canopy that are not neighbors. And Interestingly, the boom call, if it predates hawk and crack, that means the predator is not present anymore. Um, so what has been argued is that the oo basically is some kind of generalizing call part in a similar way that we have morphemes in humans. Because, uh, so basically, uh, we have hawk as eagle, and then hawk, ooh, something eagle-ish, something above us, and then crack is leopard, but then crack, ooh, something like disturbance-ish. So this is one interpretation of these, of these findings. And of course, the boom is kind of a negation particle in terms of predator is not present anymore. Um, if we were to look at this in terms of the network structure, then we would say, okay, there seem to be quite a lot of connections between the individual parts of the system, um, which is something that has not been uh, explored in detail, but is something um, to generally look at that if we have a system like that, where, for example, we have crack and Kraku, then they are, of course, in some way related. Um, and that means we have a quite, quite complex system here, um, but, um, but we need to analyze it formally as well. Um, generally, when we talk about sequence lengths, um, one thing that stands out is that uh, human sequences are much longer than any other sequences. Uh, what we do see in um, vocal sequences here in a uh, recent work by uh, Girard Boutot and, and colleagues is that even among primates, the maximum length of vocal combinations can differ quite a lot. And the number of different combinations can uh, differ also quite a lot. And the interesting thing here is that um, we see, for example, that singing species have quite long maximum lengths of vocal combinations. And then we have 
uh, chimpanzees bon uh, bonobos, especially chimpanzees with quite long observed maximum sequence lengths, and even the different combinations that have been reported for chimpanzees and gorillas, so for the gray tapes are quite high. However, um, if we look at the mean in humans, uh, we see that the maximum length, that the mean length of combinations we find for humans is much higher. And then if we go for maximum length, of course, uh, human language sentences are unlimited in their, in their length. So if we look at this part, then one other key distinction in terms of whole combinatoriality is of course that the sequence length of human language is longer both in the mean and the maximum of uh, basically any se uh, sequences reported in the primate literature because these are the maximum lengths of combinations and even the mean for humans is much much longer. Um, duality of patterning is another field where some interesting work has recently emerged namely because um, duality of patterning, like Stefan said, if we have kind of the phonemes A and P, we can use it to create pan, but we also can use it to create nap. Um, now the chestnut crowned babbler in work by Sabrina Engers and colleagues has shown, uh, has been shown to exhibit something like um, duality of patterning because they have two calls, a flight call and a prompt call. Um, and essentially, this is combined of AB and BAB. And you can see that some of these look different, but actually, um, basically, the flight call is, um, is, com um, is made out of the same perceptually equivalent items. So the flight call is AB and the prompt call is BAB. So the same sequences, meaningless vocal sequences are combined in two different ways to yield two different uh, meaningful calls. Mm. In terms of compositionality and rule systems, Southern Pied Pablas are also quite interesting because they have an alert call and a recruitment call, and they can combine the alert and the recruitment call into the mobbing sequence. So an alert call is when there's a predator nearby, uh, and a recruitment call basically just means, okay, everybody come to me in many different contexts, but they can combine these basically saying, hey, come here, uh, there's a predator, let's mob the pred predator and they can combine these two calls into alert recruitment sequences. And Japanese tits can do so as well. The interesting thing now is that um, if it's reversed, first a recruitment call and then an alert call, they don't react in the same way. Only if it's an alert call first, followed by a recruitment call, um, do they show the behavior and do they interpret it as a meaningful call combination? So there seems to be some um, potential for something like compositional um, phrases in um, these communication systems, although to a very limited degree. And that's the main thing to take away from that is, first of all, that maybe there is evidence for something like simple compositionality. Um, and for example, you know, the um, Campbell's monkeys alarm call system or in the Southern Pied Babblers alert recruitment system. But um, this is quite different from complex compositionality um, of the kind we see in human language. And on the other side, something um, coming back to what Stefan said about the usage-based perspective um, in particular, not all of language is compositional. We have idioms like kick the bucket. Um, we have contextual modulation, like the child is safe versus the shovel is safe. In the first um, case, the child is safe, we mean the child is not in danger. And when we say the shovel is safe, we mean the shovel does not end endanger others. And metaphors and metonymies, of course, are also not compositional in the strict degree. And this brings us to 
basically a view of language, language evolution, animal communication, where we should say that there are many types of combinatoriality, both in humans and non-human animals. So on the left-hand side, you can um, see kind of illustration from a paper by um, Sabrina Engelsen and Simon Townsend on the different types of combinatoriality. And on the right-hand side, you see a typical construction grammar um, view of complexity and schematicity and how basically different parts of language also show different degrees of combinatoriality, compositionality. And so the more interesting thing in the future might be to actually look more fine-grained at specific functions like affixation, for example, and to the degree that they are similar and dissimilar. Um, this is what we in a um, paper have started to argue that construction grammar is an interesting um, approach to that and we called it construction grammar for monkeys in a tongue-in-cheek um, reference to Tomasello's paper construction grammar for kids and we also um, kind of developed that in um, the paper that this presentation is based on. The last thing I briefly want to talk about is the emergence of compositionality in the lab um, which many of you will be familiar with um, so cultural transmission and iterated learning guarantee that over time the language language becomes easier to learn if an artificial language is learned. So it adapts to the learning mechanisms and cognitive biases of the learner. Um, it becomes more structured and compositionality emerges and language is shaped by the brain. That's kind of the traditional view of um, the iterated learning paradigm. Something more recent that's very interesting is that, sim and that similar results basically can be achieved without generational turnover in communities of interacting participants. And one caveat to that, um, and this is a, a classical example where um, at first participants learn arbitrary kind of combinations, and after a number of um, transmission chains, uh, basically, the last group who kind of gets the input from previous groups um, will end up with a compositional system. Here, for example, we have Negala and Nilagala, and clearly Gala here indicates the shape. And here we have Niguru and Nilaguru. So Guru seems to indicate the shape, and Nene and Nela Nela, the color. Um, one thing that has to be mentioned here is there are some limitations. The evidence of compositionality is based on individual examples as analyzed manually by the authors. So um, if you see, okay, these systems are, uh, are compositional, this is actually based on manual and analysis and not on kind uh, some kind of um, objective criterion. More recent work has work with using segmentation algorithms, but the question of how you actually measure compositionality in the lab um, is still outstanding. Right, so to sum up, the role of compositionality in language evolution, there's lots of open questions. Um, apart from the ones we've mentioned, questions are to what degree do other behaviors and cognitive abilities exhibit compositionality, such as tool making and tool use and social hierarchies. How does compositionality manifest in different modalities and how do different modalities interact? So we haven't talked about signed languages in this talk at all, um, which is highly relevant. Um, multimodality and polysemiotic communication as other parts of how modalities interact. And we have presented a view of compositionality as a gradual phenomenon that's not all or nothing. That has important implications for language evolution. And one of them is that, especially as the animal communication literature shows, some aspects of compositionality were likely present quite early uh, in the evolution of um, human cognition. And that's it from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael and uh, Stefan. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Questions? If you have a question, please raise your virtual hand. 
and then uh, we'll take it from there. Well, I can ask if you let me, Natalie. Yes, yes, please, Anton. Uh, first, uh, first of all, I would like to know your opinion about DNA language. Is it combinatorial or compositional? And first, uh, uh, second, I would like to share uh, some ideas about perception, uh, perception of language. You know that now Chomsky came to the idea of universal grammar, innate grammar, from ideas that poverty of stimuli, that children cannot exp uh, to ex extract grammar from signals. So it should be innate, um, but it means that uh, composition, uh, combinatority or compositionality also should belong not only to the action of production, but perception of production too. So we should see how other, or see or understand how other person, uh, intention of other person to see this combinatority or compositionality in his or her action. And maybe you know this idea of kind of transcendental synthesis that uh, perception gives us only particular sounds, but to combine it to the structure, you need innate structure in your brain. So my point is that probably evolution of uh, compos uh, compositional compositionality or combinatority should go in both direction, in production and in perception. So what uh, you didn't mention perception part of uh, compositionality, and maybe you can take it as an open question too in your in your research. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, so maybe I'll just start uh, answering. Um, so I think that's a very important point at the same time. Um, so the, the general idea that we try to convey comes from a more or less usage-based perspective and the one, one feature of usage-based perspective is try to um, unify production and comprehension to a certain extent. So what this means is that if uh, the, the, um, the knowledge of language that we have um, comes from abstractions that we make over actual usage events, and that in turn means that the language that we is the, the language that, we, that is acquired by means of being, um, the utterances we've encountered before the loop between production and comprehension. Uh, so it's hard to distinguish these two. We don't um, that it's something that we should on to what extent um, compositionality is basically on the on the side of the uh, extent it is of the language produced types also be pieces. Um, an interesting um, remark, definitely. Okay, um, you, you kind of broke up there towards the end, Stefan. Uh, maybe oh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll I'll, I'll I'll reiterate some some points. Uh, first, I'm going to shamelessly plug a paper in the chat that <laughs> Stefan and I wrote, uh, comparing um, kind of this this bilinguistic Chomskyan perspective and the usage based perspective. Um, and like Stefan said, like we are we're we're usage based. Uh, linguists so we don't subscribe to the poverty of the stimulus argument um, okay. or Chomsky's idea of universal grammar um, we are more interested in general cognitive capacities um, although um, and then of course the thing is that innateness is a very complicated term and what it exactly means and how kind of you know biology interacts with the environment and epigenetic factors that's very complex so um that that is why we we not only we really don't really go into this g direction um i think the other point you made about perception and production and that what especially i have shown was mostly production i think that's a very good point um 
And it probably comes kind of from this idea that if we're interested in general cognitive capacities, then they can either come from production or from reception. Yes. And um, there is, in fact, really interesting work. Um, I mentioned at the um, beginning, at the, at the end, for example, what about compositionality and other cognitive behaviors? So tool making, for example, and something that has been um, observed and analyzed, especially um, in primates, is um, social hierarchies. So um, Robert Seifarth and Dorothy Cheney, for example, they have argued that actually um, the foundation of syn syntax it lies in uh, perception and namely in the way that primates deal with social hierarchies. And so, for example, uh, baboons are very good at knowing kind of which people in yeah. their group of about 50 um, are in relation to each other. And then if you play, for example, kind of a, um, a, um, kind of a fake interaction where the hierarchy doesn't match, so the dominant makes a submissive grunt and the submissive makes a dominant grunt, then oh. they are confused because they have that. So I think that's a very, very good point and something we should definitely, I, I think, look more at in terms of the comprehension, because especially with animal communication signals, we know that a lot of work is done pragmatically by the recipient in interpreting the behavior. Yeah. So a lot of meaning comes from, in fact, a comprehension and inference. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting that it's kind of um, universal. Mm, we the problem is how to find universal language because it should be both uh, a speaker and receiver should share something and through the sharing something intersubjective they could understand each other and probably language is kind of finding that something that we could we share something that we have in common and that's the basis for construction of kind of universal uh, or mutual communication. Okay, it's just a remark. Okay. Thank no, I, but I, I think that's also a very, very good, good point. Yeah. And we've have we've also um, talk, talked about this, and people have talked about this, especially also from a usage based point of view, because interaction and that meaning is something that happens in interaction. That actually it is only in yes. interaction that we Image. build structures. Yes, um, yes in um, thinking, for example, of par paradigms like uh, emergent grammar, for example, by Paul yes, Hopper, yes, yes. Um, that, that is something that's very important. And so if we ask basically about meaning making in interaction, okay. then we have to look at human interaction and basically the interactive capacities and the act interactive mechanisms that happen in real time online to see how we make meaning probably this meaning is already compositional oh, yeah. so you could say that compositionality can be something that even if it's not there in language emerges in the interaction itself that's, that's a very yeah. very good point yeah. yeah thank you very much more questions It's a lot to think about them. Yeah. Um, how convinced are you by the drumming example of that being a compositionality or a blend? Um, I came across this, this paper saying that it's like a blend today. Uh, and then I thought, oh, I have to have to get to put it, put, <laughs> have to put it into the presentation. But I'm, I'm not quite, quite sure my, myself if uh, kind of, that is a um, interpretation that's licensed, especially because it's a reanalysis re of some observations, um, and it's not not like a quantitative study or anything. Uh, I could add to this. Uh, you did mention a B language, a dance language. It is interesting because it pre uh, presupposes kind of counting, because the length of the vagal dance shows the distance. So it means that they could uh, calculate the amount of waggling 
and this depends uh, will determine uh, the the length of the flight. So um, it's a kind of combination of uh, waggling with the amount of actions. So uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not a compositionality, but it's a kind of calculation. Uh, you should. Um, uh, this, uh, to make distinction between elements and uh, count it, and I don't know, maybe it could also have something similar with the drum drum uh, language. But de 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 definitely, I, I think we would yeah. put that under limited compositionality. It's compositionality, but it's just about one thing, uh, about like the the direction of of nectar in in flowers. Yes. Um, yes. But but it is a, it's a, it's a, a compositional compositional system because with, with you, you angle, do angle to the sun, yeah 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 because you yeah. do get the meaning of the complete message from the meaning of its parts and so it yes, qualifies yes, for compositionality yeah. but it's just basically but you just get one kind of message at the end yeah so they need to take into account many angle and count uh, the Wiggle and also the smell of the bee. So they combine three, three uh, channels for to to create a message. Yeah, and apparently there's also the intensity of the vibration of yes, the bee exactly, while it's yes, dancing, yeah, indicating yeah. the quality of. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's the multi multi uh, vocabulary, multiple vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. More questions. Olga has a question. Hi, Olga. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, could I add a comment? Um, Michael, you asked um, how convinced uh, people are of the drumming um, example. I think it's pretty interesting, um, but um, it, it seems to me that, um, as you've mentioned, we, we kind of lack in maybe the very common ground definition of what compositionality would be. And then if we try to find it in other animal communicative systems, like, what is it exactly? What does it mean? And, and how do we measure it? That would be important to define before we try to go somewhere and find it. And second aspect is, it seems to me that there is, again, this, you know, desire to find this, one of these elements that is unique to human language, and then we find it somehow in animals. And um, it's as if, okay, that's not the thing. Let's look at something else. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I would expect actually a lot of things that we see in human language to be present in hu in animal cognition or communication. But to me, the question is sort of how habitual it is. Um, how much do they use it? How flexible it is? How much do they rely on it? Because um, that can tell you more about the ability itself, so to speak. If you make an analogy with um, bipedalism, for example, a lot of animals can sometimes walk on their legs, um, on their lower limbs, but only humans are habitually bipedal and that brings a lot of changes to our morphology and a lot of other things. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good, good, good point. And I think that's why people also, for example, are interested in, you know, symbol trained uh, non-human primates, for example, uh, because then they, show capacities they don't show in the wild for example um yeah and and like like we we briefly mentioned we really like this idea of that compositionality is not an all or nothing thing but we look at different things like there's reduplication in human language there's affixation uh in human language and what can we there's like word order uh, as a meaning meaningful element and can we find kind of correlations to of specific kind of con constructions uh, or constructional phenomena in animal communication. It's more productive. Mm -hmm. More questions or comments? Well, then I think we're going to move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Stefan and Michael. Thanks a lot. Very interesting talk. There's a lot of things to think about. Thank you very much.
And so our uh, second speaker, uh, well, our third speaker for the second talk today is Olga Vazileva, and she is a recent PhD, many congratulations with the PhD, from Simon Fraser University in Canada. And she's going to talk about Evo Devo and language evolution. Please, Olga, go ahead. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'll try to share my screen. Okay. Um, so uh, actually, can you make it bigger, please? Is it too small? Yeah, we, we still see the small. If you go to the bottom next to your recycling bin, and then no, just a bit higher on your PowerPoint. You have. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you mean the. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah, just okay, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yes. That's it. So um, first of all, I have to apologize because I emailed uh, Natalie uh, rather late and I said, well, actually, I'm going to change the topic of my presentation a little bit. It's not going to be about Ivo Divo um, in language evolution, but I will talk about evolution and development. So the title of my talk is rather modern evolutionary psychology. So you say modern evolutionary and psychology and whether we are asking the right questions. I would like to begin by giving you a disclaimer or more of a confession. This talk is a result of a lot of thinking, but at the same time, I don't think I can offer any firm solutions or conclusions to you. The talk is about evolution. It's not totally unrelated. Um, so I plan to provide some tentative suggestions and I'm wondering if you like them. Um, the questions I'm interested in are how do we define origins of mind or how do we define mind itself? And with asking questions like this, it's a very helpful that I don't have formal philosophical, um, formal training in philosophy. And of course, you know, when, when you approach any question of what mind is, um, good luck finding probably less um, ontologically sophisticated um, topic because so many discipline, disciplines um, in, were interested in it and examined these questions. And I think the questions like these are pan-disciplinary and they are very important for varied um, branches of science and knowledge. And my own background in psychology and linguistics with interest in evolution definitely made me um, wonder these very questions. So, because my talk is the last of the, the, the last talk in this year, um, I hope it will be sort of more of an invita invitation for a um, discussion. Um, I, like I said, not going to offer you a lot of um, solutions, but um, I'm going to do my favorite thing, which is just share my thoughts with um, really smart people and pick up your minds on the topic. So when we're thinking about evolutionary and developmental psychology, these two disciplines actually um, are kind of in a way similar because they're both dealing with the origins of mind and behavior. So in development, we're thinking from wherever you think the premature infantile form of cognition of mind is to its development to an adult form. And then in evolutionary um, psychology, we're thinking whatever is it the form of lack of mind or absence of it or very primitive cognitive abilities to the development of the human type of cognition and behavior. Researchers working in these disciplines are forced to study very dynamic and complex systems. And I think to some extent um, debates within these disciplines parallel similar arguments within each other. For example, in child development, we're talking about nature, nurture, or biology and environment. What is it that determines the final product? What is it that determines child character, personality, abilities, and so on? Is it genetic endowment or is it environment in which this organism, such as human child, developed? And similarly, we can think about debates regarding the role of genes in evolution. If we compare views of Gould and um, uh, Dawkins, for example, and the ideas of what happens at the phenotype environment interaction level, is it simply a selection um, on phenotypes, on the final products of whatever genes sort of dictated in development or whether phenotypes are co-constructed and um, phenotype environment interaction is a little more dynamic um, in that sense. 
up to very general question of quantity versus quality. If we're comparing th this big debate whether animal cognition is differing from that in humans in its quantity or quality, do they have all the same things, they just to a lesser sort of degree, or is their cognition fundamentally different? And similarly, we think about quantity of quality um, in child development in very young children. Is there, are their mental abilities already present there from birth? They just not completely evolved to an adult um, level or whether their cognitive development represents some form of system that emerges and changes its qualities uh, with time and over a lifespan. So with big questions like this, I think we expect to see some attempts to define the very essence of the research subject. So for people working in these disciplines to, you know, try to think, well, what is development or what is behavior or what is mind. Before we proceed, I would like to mention three uh, major applications of evolutionary thought to psychology that are common in the West. First of all, we have evolutionary psychology in the narrow sense, sometimes referred to as Santa Barbara School of Evolutionary Psychology, which refers to a very specific theoretical premise, and that is that human uh, cognition evolved in the time of Pleistocene. We are adapted to this environment, which is our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, and our mind is modular in structure. And basically, um, our brain consists full of functional modules that are also um, adaptations designed to uh, solve particular adaptive problems. Um, there is human behavior ecology, which stresses adaptation to the current environment. And within this discipline, within this approach, people study life history, um, questions of resource allocation and environmental cues um, in development of certain phenotypes. In comparison with evolutionary psychology of Santa Barbara, human behavior ecology is more um, concerned with adaptation to the current environment as well in sort of the array of these adaptive responses that are available to an organism, including humans. Finally, gene culture coevolution, um, or sometimes referred to as cultural evolution, dual inheritance systems, um, the, really not a unified field in my view, but, but rather um, a number of approaches, all of which um, constitute culture as the main driving force of human evolution. And within this framework, we normally study cross-cultural, do cross-cultural research. Uh, we look at social learning and transmission of um, knowledge through social learning um, and particular adaptive behaviors through cultural as cultural traits. So the three major approaches differ in their research focus, assume drives of human development or the importance of um, the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, for example, but also their understanding of the research subject. What is it that they study, in other words? There is no common ground regarding what does evolutionary psychology study today. This is um, the point that I'm trying to make throughout this talk. So if we try to define science, through its subject. I looked at some definitions, um, and I'm not ashamed of it, I looked at Wikipedia, where uh, the definition is the following. Psychology is the scientific study of mind and behavior. Psychology includes the study of conscious and unconscious phenomena, including feelings and thoughts. It is an academic discipline of immense scope, crossing the boundaries between the natural, the natural and social sciences. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at the definition provided by the Encyclopedia Britannica. Psychology scientific discipline that studies mental states and processes and behavior in humans and other animals. So what about evolutionary psychology? If we look at Wikipedia, evolutionary psychology is a theoretical approach in the social and natural sciences, okay, that examines psychological structure from a modern evolutionary perspective. Fine. It seeks to identify which human psychological traits are evolved adaptations, that is, the functional products of natural selection or sexual selection human evolution. Now, that seems a little bit limiting to me. 
Encyclopedia Britannica, I think, gives a little bit better definition. The study of behavior, thought, and feeling as you, through the lens of evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychologists, presume all human behaviors reflect the influence of physical and psychological predispositions that helped human ancestors survive and reproduce. Perhaps it's just me, but I'm not particularly satisfied with these definitions. So, I decided to ask my students, did a pilot study asking my students in Canada and Russia and asked them this um, question, what um, evolutionary psychology is the science of what? Just an open-ended kind of question continued. What does evolutionary psychology study? And my students' responses in Canada, these were undergrads taking an upper level course and graduate students in Russia. They, their responses were pretty similar. So in Canada, people tended to say um, evolutionary psychology studies mind, thinking and behavior. And then in Russia, um, psych uh, or cognition. So um, Anton might correct me here, but psychika um, imeshlenia. I think these are pretty close um, translations. Okay, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. psych, I think, would be. Um, well, some of them also responded in English. But the bottom line is, uh, I think the responses overall were pretty similar. So I thought, wouldn't evolutionary psychology study mind, cognition, and behavior development in evolution? This seems to be a logical continuation to me. And I decided to start meta research on evolutionary psychology. I looked at flagman journals of the field, Human uh, Behavior and Evolution Journal, and Evolutionary Psychology. Um, so far, I looked at 537 articles. About only 40 of them were theoretical, so the less um, the others, the rest are empirical. I was looking at major topics of research, and such topics predominantly include things like mate choice, sexual selection, cooperation and aggression, social environmental cues, fitness and biological markers of adaptation. Which is my hypothesis, but I think the very choice of these topics reflect the historical development of evolutionary psychology in the West, in the West and that is it originated in behaviorism with the idea of um, strict observations, um, objective observations of behavior and little reference to cognitive um, stance. Uh, it borrowed a lot from sociobiology, which brings us the topics such as main choice and cooperation or the biological origins of social behavior in animals, just transferred sort of to humans. But then it also coincided with the cognitive revolution, so to speak. So the ideas of computational modules and this hardware and software in the brain, all those things that cognitive, early cognitive science brought to psychology are also reflected in, uh, reflected in evolutionary psychology. So it seems to me that the discipline is really the study of behavior rather than the mind or internal psychological processes. In these journals, there is very limited research on language or cognition or attempts to look at these topics or attempts to conceptualize them in any way. And it, it kind of seems like there is very little interest in these topics at all. And mind or psych structure is frequently just assumed based on theoretical framework. So if you are describing to um, evolutionary psychology, kind of Santa Barbara version, then you would just assume that mind consists of these uh, computational modules and um, wouldn't bother looking further into its structure. Um, what was interesting to me was to see the severe lack of comparative research, which I think is very striking given the evolutionary focus of the discipline. So if we compare um, textbook in evolutionary psychology with the textbook in evolutionary biology. In evolutionary biology, I think when you open one, it will give you some, sorry, the, the presentation wants to run on its own, um, would uh, give the uh, basic uh, kind of definition, well, here is evolution, this is how it works in different organisms, starting from most primitive to most complex ones. And if we open a textbook in evolutionary psychology, it says, all humans are affected by evolution, and here's how. 
So it almost looks like the whole evolutionary story starts from humans. Out of 498 articles, there were only 18 that were discussing other species, and all of them were primates. If we're looking at developmental aspect, out of these articles, um, only 35 studied um, children, so looked at any kind of developmental uh, picture. Now, other researchers compared, to, uh, looked at uh, the weird nature of evolutionary psychology. Pollitt and Sexton, for example, um, um, published a paper uh, titled How Diverse Are the Samples Used in the Journals of Evolution and Human Behavior in Evolutionary Psychology? And not surprisingly, as in many other branches of psychology, unfortunately, our samples are hugely non-diverse. They come predominantly from Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies, which essentially means that when David Bass, um, in his book, Evolutionary Psychology, The New Science of the Mind, says that evolutionary psychology is the kind of discipline that could potentially unify psychology in the same way as evolutionary theory has unified biology, um, a lot of empirical research, the very topics um, of it, and, and, and all, most of the data we get comes from study of North American um, undergraduate students in North American universities. Um, this is what it comes down to. So it seems to me, based on this preliminary analysis, is that Evolutionary psychology ends up just being the study of which behavioral patterns of modern day humans can be explained by evolution, rather than what is mind and behavior, including human mind and behavior, and how they evolved evolutionary. And I think these are two fundamentally differing research questions. And I think that the first one um, ends up being the one that we're focusing on, uh, but neglect of the second actually impedes the progress of the discipline itself. Evolutionary psychology has been criticized extensively, including for things like, for example, its disconnect with the more advanced and sophisticated evolutionary biology, sort of more modern day evolutionary biology. The discipline faces some obstacles in explaining development of the human mind in phylogeny. And I think that one of the main obstacles is lack of the common approach to the subject of evolutionary psychology. So if researchers attempt to understand how human mind and behavior evolved in evolution, it is essential to find some common ground of what mind is and how it relates to behavior in evolution. So before we can meaningfully pose a question of how psychological processes and structures have evolved, which structures play the major role in the development of human abilities and phylogeny, and even um, in the same framework as it's usually done, which behaviors um, are shaped by evolution in modern day humans, or whether animals have similar abilities um, with that in humans, it is essential that we define what kind of psychological processes are we investigating? What are the structures of the mind in humans and other organisms? And how did these structures change at varied stages of phylogenetic development? Um, other scholars took more, um, in my opinion, not only mine, but um, other scholars as well, um, systemic approach to psychology, and I find it pretty interesting. So people like Vygotsky, who studied developmental and comparative psychology you know, in order to understand what mind uh, is and what is structure. So he addressed development and he addressed the question of evolution because he wanted to understand what mind is. And he thought the, the latter question cannot be answered without addressing this too. And similarly, we cannot understand development or evolution without addressing the question of what mind is. These two are sort of bidirectional. Um, other researchers, such as Nadezhda Nikolaevna Ladigina Kotz, for example, in early 20th century, um, conducted one of the first comparative research in primate and human ontogenetic development with similar ideas, um, carefully analyzing and describing um, ontogenetic development of a primate that of a chimp and a human child and comparing them and trying to figure out um, what kind of behaviors do we see what they mean and then making inferences regarding the internal psychological processes related to these behaviors 
I think it's also interesting that one of um, probably most well-known developmental psychologist, um, Jean Piaget, who came up with the stage uh, of cognitive development, stage theater of development, uh, also determines these stages in terms of systemic relationship between an organism and its environment. In this case, the child. So he's looking at particular stages. He assumes what mental processes are happening and then what kind of behavioral or, or operations these mental processes allow, how the structure of the mind changes and what it allows an organism to do. And Piaget himself was deeply interested in evolutionary thinking, for example, of Eddington's work and um, the ideas of um, epigenetic landscape. Uh, in a similar manner, people working um, more in um, evolutionary psychology, so to speak. For example, Alexei Leontiev um, in Russia was looking at organism morphology, its nervous system, the ecology or environment in which it lives and behavior activity that is available. And he came up with the also stage theory of phylogenetic development of mind, um, thinking about the relationship between structure of activity and mental reflection um, that are unified. So certain types of mental reflection allow for a particular structure of activity and vice versa. And these are different in different animals, depending on the type of nervous system and environment they live in. And again, I see connection here with um, stage theory um, that Jean Piaget proposed, for example, because we see this um, unifying principle of thinking about an organism and its environment. Um, just one was focusing on ontogenetic development and this one is focusing on more phylogenetic development, how the system gets more and more complex um, throughout evolutionary development. Um, I think that researchers dealing with complex emergent systems come up with somewhat similar ideas. For example, they conceptualize in development through increasingly more complex interaction between the internal states and external environment. And again, we see it in different disciplines. Developmental thinkers turn to evolutionary and systems biology for inspiration, for trying to understand how can we describe development. And evolutionary thinkers turn to complexities of ontogenetic and individual development, variation in individual development, canalization, um, reproduction of phenotypes, uh, d despite noise um, and what's not. So we see these connections between different disciplines. Uh, the Russian School of Evolutionary Psychology, what I call it because it's um, not really unified school, but rather an ensemble of really fantastic researchers who worked um, in the discipline, um, I think have some unifying principles and perhaps um, more um, interesting proposals. First of all, it is this idea that human mind is a special case of very general cognitive and or psychological evolution. So whatever we see in humans is just more advanced, in some cases, development of whatever exists in animals. Humans are not kind of freaks of nature. We can think about evolution of mind and cognition as a continuum. And that evolutionary approach is essential for understanding what is mind, what is behavior, and what are their structure. For example, in 1922, uh, Severtsev uh, was um, analyzing basic adaptation um, types of behavior and adaptation to change in environment. And he suggested that mind and cognition increases animal's ability to adapt to change in environment faster. So in other words, cognition can become an evolutionary force. Um, as Konstantin Anohin, modern day um, evolutionary neuroscientist um, says, evolution sort of cares about the nervous system. A lot of evolutionary pressure and attention is concerned with the nervous system in various phyla and um, research um, such as studies done at Allen Brain Institute, for example, show that a big number of genes showing evidence of positive selection, again, in varied organisms, from mice to humans. Genes are expressed in the brain. So for a lack of a better word, evolution does care about the nervous system. So can we attempt to define mind 
from an evolutionary perspective. And I thought we could try to do so. I'm going to offer one potential um, trajectory. Um, again, I'm sure that uh, it's not the perfect one, but I think it is it is a start. So if we're thinking about the uh, development of circulatory system, right, we can think about its evolution from more simple to more complex ones, and then the increasing complexity of the function of the circulatory system in different classes of animals. What if we were to do a similar thing with um, nervous system? It turns out, and for a lack of time, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, we can, I'll, I'll be happy to discuss it if um, anyone is interested. Um, we can think about evolution of nervous system um, through particular trends that emerge in evolution. These trends are increasing complexity, functional specialization, and simultaneously integration of functions. So on the one hand, we see that there are certain parts of the nervous system that become responsible for particular you know, abilities or processing certain information, but at the same time, it seems that there is a lot of integration, there is a lot of connection between these different parts. They start all working together, not independently from each other. We see increased lateralization, which is also, um, also suggests to us that this is increased specialty of our brain, because when our brain, whenever it becomes kind of interested or specialized in something, um, we usually see lateralized processing of this information. We see increased plasticity from more, even in human brain, from older, um, so to say, uh, parts of the brain, from brain stem, from subcortical structures to neocortex, we see increasing plasticity. In the neocortex, there are huge areas of the brain that are not primary cortices, but associative cortices. And these are the types of, these are neurological structures that are not necessarily specializing at any particular information, such as, for example, processing um, primary visual cortex, which is focused on visual information. But associative areas are there to deal with any kind of information. Quite often, amodal information coming from different sources of perception and sensation um, to sort of make sense of reality um, of an organism, for lack of a better word. So the brain and nervous uh, system structure overall correlate with the type of cognition the animal has. So that is the kind of problems it solves, how it processes information, how it navigates in the environment, its ability for learning and so on. The type of behavior the animal can perform and the complexity of behavioral programs, adaptability of these programs and so on. And also the species environment. So in other words, brain structure can be informative to an extent of the kind of environment the organism is adapted to, what information it processes, what information is important for this organism to survive in a given environment. Sensory organs and various cognitive abilities are not coincidental in evolution and allow the organism or species better survival and reproduction. So if we're looking at, you know, who are the smart animals with so much data now coming from comparative psychology, from comparative research, from researching animal cognition. It seems that smarter quote-unquote animals are the ones that are capable of better representation of the environment, the subjective internal representation. They can operate mental images rather than go through trial and error um, in every problem they need to solve. We see on neurological level increased associative cortexes and great in integration of information, which we think might be connected to creation of mental representation. So in other words, this allows animals form behavioral programs more effectively. And these ideas are based on um, you know, Kurt Fabry and Alexei Leontiev um, suggestions. At the same time, um, smarter animals are also capable of plasticity and anticipation of behavior. So things that uh, Pyotr Anohin um, talked about, for example, and investigated in his work. In nature, any behavior adaptation is relative to the actual environmental conditions and is a matter of probability. 
So if an animal lives in a flexible and constantly changing environment, the adaptability of behavior is really inseparable from its plasticity and anticipation. The better the animal is capable of anticipation, the better chances to react appropriately in a given environment. And then adaptiveness of behavioral programs is determined by their excessiveness and their flexibility. In this scenario, in a changing environment for complex animals, it is not adaptive to have only pre-selected number of highly conserved behavioral responses because they wouldn't be sufficient enough to solve adaptive problems. In a similar manner, Eugenie Pano, for example, stresses important trends in cognitive evolution, increasing independence from the environment, flexibility of behavior, ability to represent the environment to create its mental representation, whatever we call it, cognitive maps, memories, concepts in their relation to each other. Um, as Jim Herford uh, says in one of his books, you know, you, you can call it thoughts, you can call it ideas, call it what you want, but we have this idea that, that there, there is something in our head that is different uh, from, you know, to eat or to be eaten, and these two would be different from a concept of a car, for example. In a similar manner, God, uh, Peter Godfrey Smith talks about cognitive evolution as the evolution of mental representation. So these ideas are there, they're not unique to the Russian School of Evolutionary Psychology, but it, I really feel that they are kind of overlooked by the mainstream evolutionary science and evolutionary psychology. <clears throat> we can think about cognitive evolution or development of mind in phylogeny as increasing separation between mental images and operations with them from direct perceptual experiences and form of formation of behavioral programs based on this. So this to me suggests a new interesting approach to evolutionary psychology. First of all, it is important to address comparative aspect. What are psychological processes in general? What are psychological processes in living organisms, in animals and humans? Which patterns and features are adaptive, predominant, or most important for humans? So if you really like modules, let it be. But does that mean that all animals also have formed these modules based on their environmental evolutionary adaptiveness? Um, it's important to answer these questions, I think. Uh, we know that human mind within evolutionary framework is a natural continuation of animal type of cognition. And for every organism, the mind is intimately related to the type of behavior exhibited and the type of environment an organism lives in. The key feature of the human environment, of course, is its social and cultural nature. Human mind becomes mediated by culture and language in both ontogeny and phylogeny. And the progress of evolutionary psychology as a science is contingent upon its ability to integrate neurological, biological levels with the notion of cultural environment and evolutionary origins of the human mind, as well as more consistent attempts to define mind and its relation to behavior from the evolutionary perspective. So this is my tentative conclusion or suggestion number one. I really would like to read you this quote of um, Jeff Vygotsky, which I absolutely adore. And I think it's very interesting when he reflects on the system of psychology and so such a system of psychology has not yet been created. We can see with confidence that it will not arise out of the ruins of empirical psychology or in the laboratories of reflexologists, which um, could be close uh, for a Western reader, um, laboratories of behaviors. It will come as a broad biosocial synthesis of the theory of animal behavior and societal man. This new psychology will be a branch of general biology and at the same time the basis of all sociological sciences. It will be the knot that ties the science of nature and the science of man together. It will therefore indeed be most intimately connected with philosophy, but with a strictly scientific philosophy, which represents the combined theory of scientific knowledge and not with the speculative philosophy that preceded scientific generalizations. So um, I'm, I think Think that such system of psychology has not yet been created and I think it is the kind of system that evolutionary psychology at least from um, descriptions of it would aspire to be. So cognition and behavior evolved evolutionary 
Cognition and behavior are not human unique. Mind governs behavior to some extent, development of psychological processes allow an organism to adapt to the environment. Cognitive complexities have emerged multiple times independently in various types and classes of animals. And this is very important. Again, it's not that humans are really weird because we're that smart. But we see that complex thinking independently involves in complex animals, it evolves in birds, in mammals, and so on. It's not just humans, not even just primates. So this means, at least this suggests to me, that behavior in psych or behavior in mind are really ways of adaptation and tools for evolutionary progress. They are the interface between an organism and its environment where systemic patterns emerging through these interactions potentially may change the course of evolution for the population. In other words, they become an evolutionary force. And this is a second tentative conclusion. Now, as Carol Stott says, which kind of evolutionary theory you apply matters deeply for which kind of evolutionary psychology you get. And I think this is very true. But I think sort of the opposite is true as well. The role you ascribe to mind and behavior in evolution as well matters deeply for the kind of evolutionary theory you end up with. So on the topic of asking the right questions and bidirectional influences, um, multiple scholars before suggested that evolutionary psychology would be enriched with modern evolutionary biology, you know, the systems biology perspective, discoveries in epigenetics, ideas of the extended evolutionary theories, in the um, evolutionary developmental biology, and this really important role that development plays in evolution, it seems to be the, um, the understanding more widespread, widespread at least in evolutionary biology. But at the same time, I think evolutionary biology would be enriched by incorporation of behavioral plasticity, cognitive evolution. These new emergent um, fields that used to be tabooed for a long time, starting from mid of the, sun of the 20th century till mostly recently, the ideas of non-genetic inheritance, niche construction, learning and plasticity as evolutionary factors, uh, the work of Baldwin, and, and again, the extended evolutionary theory, uh, synthesis, sorry, the, the idea is that we need something more than just transfer of genetic information, and all of it should be incorporated into evolutionary theory. So while modern evolutionary psychology um, sometimes is criticized for being based on outdated assumptions of modern evolutionary synthesis, I'm thinking the letter itself perhaps is based on somewhat outdated view of behavior, cognition, and their role in evolution. So this is my third tentative and final conclusion for the talk. I want to thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'm left with so many more questions <laughs> than I started from, but I'm very happy that I got to share my ideas uh, with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Olga, for this very interesting talk. You did send me a message that you changed your title, and I did forget that. So, for you, for you. <laughs> but, I didn't um, want people to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember now, and actually, I, I, I don't know if there are questions, but I have a lot of things that I want to throw back at you um, um, uh, because it's, it's very interesting. I thought your talk was very interesting, but um, I, I, I also like hear from that like you know you are trained in, in psychology and then you have the question of what is evolutionary psychology coming in from psychology and so of course you're going to ask about where is the study of the mind and all and and uh like for me like what what i what i want to respond and and uh, insofar as i know a bit of the history of of uh uh, scientific thinking in, in those areas in symbolic evolution. I think it's absolutely true that evolutionary psychology is much more anthropology than that it is psychology and the study of the mind. Um, uh, also because of how it has grown, because much of evolutionary psychology as we know it today is basically a reformulation of sociobiology. And it is a reformulation of, of what used to be called social Darwinism. And because uh, uh, these schools of thought have been attacked in so many ways, people try to avoid being called a sociobiologist. They try to, be avo avoid, they try to avoid the term of social Darwinism. 
And so they ended up with evolutionary psychology, while much of that really is anthropological research and, and ecological anthropological research, as it was defined by people such as Rappaport, for example, in the 60s. And so there you, you have really anthropological research on, on um, uh, kinship and kinship concepts and, and uh, um, uh, societal structures, matriarchies, patriarchies, all of that, insects, incest, incest, insect, <laughs> insect taboo, no, incest taboo, and all of those things, um, uh, which are studied traditionally by uh, Margaret Mead, and that even goes further back to, to, to like, um, uh, uh, pragmatism and, and the, the, the recognition that there are uh, different cultures and the, the discussions about whether there is one culture or multiple cultures. So that is one, one way that I want to reply. Another way that I want to reply is that much of what you define as psychology and as a study of the mind and as a study of cognition is alive today in fields such as biosemiotics and semiotics, evolutionary epistemology, and also cognitive ethology, and also for e-cognition. And then my question uh, to you would be then how um, you see this Russian tradition that you refer to associate more with those fields? Uh, here's again where my my lack of, of training in history and philosophy comes very handy, so I can offer only uh, some kind of personal opinions. I think you're absolutely right. So uh, the, the, it seems to be that there are other fields that are looking at these things more so. Even the topic of animal cognition would be different. So I try to look, okay, what is comparative psychology study? Um, things like that. There, there is obviously a rich tradition there, but it still it still bugs me that we there seems to be a lack of desire to come with some unified framework. Because practically speaking, those who do evolutionary psychology don't talk don't talk to those who do animal cognition, and none of them talk to those who do language evolution. These are different crowds. These are different playgrounds. Um, and each of them has their own history. I don't want to say that this research is bad and this research is awesome. I just really want to put them all together and say, guys, you got to talk to each other. <laughs> like you got to come up with something. And I think that uh, with all the limitations that um, historically also the, the Russian so-called school is, and I refer to this Russian because Sivrisov was in Imperial Russia started in, in you know, the, the Soviet time and Konstantin Anokhin today, for example, this is um, modern day post-Soviet period, uh, but there seems to be this more deep thinking, so to say, tradition, intellectual tradition of, of this thinking about behavior and cognition as inseparable from physiology and neurophysiology, but also the evolutionary Part. So, so the environment, the evolution, development, this is why I think it's so interesting that Vygotsky you know, bothered about it. He wanted to know what mind is, and he thinks, I cannot answer this question if I don't look at evolution, if I don't look at development, studying, and also the abnormal psychology. So he thought studying an adult human gives me nothing <laughs> in terms of understanding. And similarly, Piaget. He's thinking deeply about how complex system, human mind, how does it emerge from very non-adult form to an adult one? How does it change? And he's thinking about complex biological systems. Well, how do these interactions emerge? And I think that there is some interesting parallels with um, more of these understanding of more complex situations and interactions in that information is transferred, yes, through genes, but not only that the genes do play a role, but they don't determine the phenotype to the same extent as we thought they, they did, you know, in, in the 50s. So um, there, there's a lot of, um, a lot more intellectual work to be done. And um, this is one of these areas where it's so rich, but this is why it's so hard, because whenever I go, from every word um, you said, right, I could go to a very deep intellectual tradition and, and look at a lot of things. 
So my uh, perspective was exactly that of a person who who is looking at who is training in linguistics and, and psychology. And I'm, I'm just wondering why there are such inconsistencies. Like one of the biggest ones that I'm concerned with is, is this lack of comparative work in evolutionary psychology, because to me, this sounds very non-evolutionary. You mm -hmm. cannot start the evolutionary story from a human. <laughs> you just cannot. You have to think about other organisms as well and how they relate to environment and maybe what is special about humans to some extent. And then with the recent discoveries in paleoanthropology as well, today we understand that our, our family um, history, evolutionary history is uh, really, it, it's not that much of a tree as it is a bush. In the same environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, there were so many different kinds of hominins who lived. And we lived together at the same time in very similar kind of ways with at least Neanderthals and Denisovans. So how different was their cognition? How different was their behavior? I know these are not easy questions to answer. So I'm, I'm not uh, surprised that not everyone attempts to, to do that. But I think it's still important to ask these questions for, for, like, for a discipline. We still need to at least attempt to figure out, maybe through indirect methods. More questions, comments? Uh, may, may I ask? Yeah, yeah. Olga, okay. Olga, I'm very disappointed. Your presentation very disappointed me because where is the Soviet social cultural approach to behavior cognition and so on. In your presentation, you gave us only a uh, uh, bottom-up approach to cognition and behavior. And indeed, uh, Santa Barbara School search for genetic biological foundations of cognition and behavior. And in your presentation, you, do, uh, you did the same. And um, indeed, uh, they tried to find uh, some kind of cognitive models in brains that responsible for human nature, for human behavior. But you and the um, social, social cultural approach to human nature and Vygotsky and uh, uh, Stort and Natalie, uh, we know that there is also top-down approach when a system, society, could influence your cognition, your uh, behavior, and probably a uh, specific of human mind is not to have some special models in um, brain, but have unique plasticity to learn any behavior, any symbolic system. And my question, I would like to, to, to direct you to the language studies. So, uh, you know that while, while children or fear of children, they, they do not receive a human nature if they don't live in society. The same, uh, they could, could not learn a complex la language after 10 years or 15, uh, 15 years. So their brains start to learn uh, complex language. So plasticity kind of um, end up after 15 or 10 years. And uh, if, we if we take language, now Chomsky, he says that only I language is real language. External language, social language is kind of rubbish noise. We shouldn't study it because a language is kind of cognitive model in our brain. In, in Russian school, in, social, uh, in Soviet school, we believe that language is a social system. And Vygotsky, he believes that uh, by the way, Mikhail and Stefan discuss uh, they separated language and tools, but Vygotsky believes that language is a symbolic tool. It's uh, the same, but a symbolic one. And through the acquisition of language, we acquire human mind, human cognition, rational thinking. So a uh, human nature is not a hardware uh, that we have in brain. But human nature is software that we have in society. So we need society to install this software on our hardware. And if we have a perfect plasticity as we have, we could learn any symbolic system, any activity, any behavior. 
So it means that human nature is we receive from society. It's top-down evolution. And question is, what do you think about language? Is it a social system, symbolic system? And grammar is not universal, but grammar in, emerge through the interaction. Or language is innate cognitive model that we have in brain. And we have kind of universal grammar. That's why we understand each other. So universal models, your uh, common understanding. Or grammar and language is external system. And meanings, they emerge from uh, social context and human nature evolves through this um, interaction with social environment. So what's, what's your point of view in this? Thank you so much for the comment, Anton. Yeah. Um, yes, I uh, did, didn't indeed uh, skip on quite a bit of Vygotsky, uh, but uh, the, I um, yeah. put, uh, put, yes, put a title of the paper where uh, me and my colleague uh, Natalia Balasnikov we're talking about this very issue, and, and we're talking about relationship between Vygotsky and you know developmental psychology, um, basically showing that. Uh, the same idea is that he proposed um, they, a long time ago. They, they become more in vogue today in people working within the same framework without realizing they're using uh, Vygotsky's ideas. Uh, indeed, when we're thinking about cultural historical approach, and Vygotsky deeply thought about that um, for sure, language and culture uh, become the tools for formation of even individual mind and for him why he called language a tool is uh, because if we're thinking about linguistic sign and the signifying signified so the meaning of it the structure of it kind of is inside everyone's head but you get the structure from the society because it's our um, it's uh, conventional yeah. So for Vygotsky, my understanding is uh, human mind has social origins, not only this broad metaphorical sense, but in a very direct and mechanistic sense. So what mm -hmm. happens in the structure, your mind structure is built by society, by interaction. Scaffolding, this idea of scaffolding is, I think, very important. Yes, scaffolding of developments through the, these symbolic tools. Some people still use it, yeah. Social scaffolding, uh, environmental scaffolding, yeah. Yes. So if you're asking my opinion about what language is, uh, yeah. I don't think it is um, any kind of a hardwired module because I think that rather than um, being this small thing that, that affects a bunch of things, language is really uh, transcends human thinking. And rather than being something very different, I think what is special about humans is this amalgamation between our communicative system and our um, cognition. So a lot of human thinking and human cognition is served by language. And so, I, I don't think that we see it to the same degree in other animals. Oh, but still innate, innate model, yeah, for you, yeah. okay. No, I don't think it's an innate module. I don't think it's a module at all. Uh, but I think there is, um, there is something, uh, I am really hesitant to say what, because I really don't know. <laughs> I really <laughs> don't know. <laughs> like, no. eh. um, there is something like a predisposition to learn it. I think more of, you know, an, an amalgamation of different biases that children enjoy interacting even infants they enjoy looking at human face they enjoy like listening to mother's voice things like that and through the small biases through constant interaction through developmental process language emerges i don't think it can possibly be explained by um, any kind of innate module okay okay more questions comments yeah i have i have uh uh, question uh, slash, slash slash comment. Uh, lots of lots of um, things to 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 think about. Uh, one one thing that struck me was that um, 
you operated with a lot of terms where I think even the terms are not agreed on in any of the disciplines that you're talking about. So uh, from, from kind of a linguist perspective, that, that seems like it would call for corpus analysis of things, uh, even like, um, you know, the context in which things like action, behavior, mind, cognition occur. Um, because the, the, the one thing, my, my, my comment here, so in, in one of your interim summaries, you wrote, mind governs behavior. And I was wondering how many, if you presented that statement to people from kind of the different fields you talked about, how many would actually agree with that statement? So I, I, I think kind of in Santa Barbara evolutionary psychology, mind is not a thing that they're interested in and so this kind of evolutionary psychology would talk about like you know the motivational system uh and the cognitive system that that uh, kind of individuals have and even if you look at chomsky for example chomsky always talks about the mind slash brain uh he never just talks about the mind really uh, in in many of his publications so so that's why you, your summaries i think they they were kind of problematic in that sense that the terms themselves they're not well defined so it's probably also kind of worth to look at philosophy of biology because that's what they do right uh <laughs> look at kind of can we actually find a way uh these terms are you know, that these terms can make sense or kind of just work out what the differences are. I uh, completely agree with you, Michael, and that's precisely the the issue because um, w with the terms like mind or behavior or how one relates to each other um, or how what's the relationship between mind and brain. Any of this we can start discussing today and we're not going to be done by summer. <laughs> and we'll still have plenty <laughs> to argue about and i think you're absolutely right uh presenting these to different people in different disciplines good luck uh there is very little common ground um, so i kind of entered this embracing myself <laughs> with understanding that there will always 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 be so many people uh who would disagree and rightfully so not just because they mean people but because there there is a lot of important discussions here at the same time i think that we we need to start from something <laughs> so you we need to probably at least start from an understanding that it should be these terms should be defined and i think for progress of this thought of whatever we call evolutionary psychology and i don't want to ascribe evolutionary psychology equated with the Santa Barbara school um, it's just it's more kind of well known in the West now but there are other ways of thinking about it right um, I, I think there are it's important that we ask these questions and we realize first that yeah we we have no idea um, what are we doing and I think the recent um, I'm not an expert by all means in this literature, but these more recent um, approaches to um, philosophy of science and evolutionary biology, the ideas of system biology and how evolution works, they, they seem to come to more appreciation or at least starting talking about things like learning or behavior um, as factors in evolution. So with incorporation of these things, I think maybe that would be an avenue for disciplines like evolutionary psychology to get inspiration from. Yeah. But it's 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 a wonderful, a wonderful endeavor trying to define mind. <laughs> Easy yeah. to do. Although, right? although possibly some of these fields would say, no, that's not a term we need. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even even when I'm reading, for example, English and Russian literature, I'm thinking just how to translate from one to another. And I'm sure you would find similar in German. It's each of these terms they have certain connotations, you know, psych, cognition, mind, thinking processes, is processes, or is it like is it a structure? Is it a process? Um, tough, 
tough stuff but but it bugs me so it bugs me that we don't talk to each other evolutionary psychologists don't talk to linguists um and uh and beside chomsky and pinker they don't know pretty much anyone uh, uh, who doesn't. that's why that's why we need a natalie group here everyone welcome yes people from different uh, departments are welcome Exactly. This is this is why I, I decided to present on this topic because um, I, I wanted this kind of you know throw all this information at you guys and for you to be puzzled and maybe even <laughs> angry and <laughs> like hold on, what about this? Um, even so. more puzzled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a good way of of ending this. Uh, presentation we're going to go over to more informal discussions but i want to end this uh, last uh, appeal webinar by thanking all the appeal members uh, and in particular the the ones that also helped to organize Elena arfini francisco balzan elena shebotareva antonio fader and jt velikovsky i want to thank the speakers and uh, many of those were also the appeal members and uh, also the additional speakers and also the audiences that uh, participated live and also after uh, on the youtube i want to thank the fct the fundação para a ciência e tecnologia and the colibri fct fcc and 2021 zoom platform for hosting and the Faculty of Science of the University of Lisbon and the Nivulgasan team for facilitating. I also want to thank Philocell and Mersen for uh, advertising. And so this is the last one of the, the appeal webinar series. I said in the beginning uh, with Antonio that we were going to do this for one year and the year has ended <laughs> and it was very fun. And I think we're going to move to a different format for uh, next year and for now, um, I wish uh, everybody happy holidays and a very prosperous and healthy 2022. And so with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Thank Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs>